Okay, everybody. Okay, everybody. Wait a minute. Let's restart, everyone. Okay. So now we are going to talk about uh, the therapeutic uses of the anti-muscarinic drugs. Right now we have just talked about the bad, bad, bad things about the muscarinic drugs. Now we are going to talk about where they are good at, where we should use them. Okay. So the thing is, I've got a message. Uh, wait a minute. Uh, okay. So let's restart the lesson. Wait a minute. Okay. Now, uh, the thing is, oh, wait, where was I? Huh? Gee, I was talking about the therapeutic uses of anti muscarinic drugs, all right? And then uh, we came up on this slide, which is actually kind of summarization of everything. Why exactly these drugs are there? which are uh, being clinically used to treat things right now what are they we are going to talk about them like very quickly and then we are going to discuss like each one of them in detail so not each one of them but effects in detail okay that how exactly in different scenarios these are used so you see atropine is used for anti-spasmodic anti-secretory management of ACHE inhibitor Antidiarrheal ophthalmology. Uh, then is tropicamide is used for ophthalmology topically. Then ipratropium, and then we have teotropium. They are used to treat asthma and COPD, which is related to inhalation. Uh, no CNS entry, no change in mucus viscosity. That is a scopolamine. It is used in motion sickness causes sedation and short-term memory block. Just imagine, you take this drug and even though it would treat the motion sickness and everything, but then again, it would sedate a person and it would block the memory of a person, right? Okay. So then is benztropine and then we have trihexyphenidyl, okay? They are lipid-soluble drugs, so they do have CNS entry, and they are used in Parkinson's disease. In acute extra pyramidal uh, symptoms include in, induced by antipsychotics. Then is oxybutynin, which is used in overactive bladder, which is urge incontinence. So let's talk about it even more. All right. You see over here, first of all, we, we are going to talk about I because uh, in my previous slide, I'm sure you noticed that, that twice I said um, ophthalmology, ophthalmology, right? So let's talk about it in more detail. So you see, the thing is short acting muscarinic antagonist, which is homotropy, cyclopentulate, tropicamide, they produce midriasis. Now, if you take a little child to a doctor's clinic and you would ask them to, uh, uh, you know, check their eye or anything. So first of all, they would tell you that they would put some drops in the eye of the baby and then they would check the eye. And second thing, the doctor would tell you that, you see, uh, the child won't be able to see for some time, for like three to four hours at least. The child is not able to see properly everything. So once I took my son to the, um, uh, like this doctor's um, clinic. So what I did was, I took him at night, like about nine o'clock. And then when he, they put the uh, pupil dilation, this medicine. So yeah, he was very much troublesome because he could not see anything properly. And then I just made him sleep instantly, you know. So it was, it's very difficult for little babies to deal with this. Um, so basically, what? why are we doing this? Why are we actually producing midriasis? When we are dilating people, 
pupil, not people, sorry. When you are when you are dilating pupil, so at that moment, you if you torch it up, right? If you like put the light on it, so you would be able to see at the back of the eye, right? What's happening there? And secondly, you would be able to see the refractive measurement. Now, what is refractive measurement? I'll talk to you about. So the thing is this: it is used. We are doing midriasis for two things, okay? Refractive measurement, and the second thing is of the uh, ophthalmoscopic uh, examination of the retina, which I just talked to you at the back of the eye. So at the back of the eye, obviously there is retina, okay? So what happens is this, along with this anti-muscarinic drug, you do add a alpha adrenoreceptor agonist, such as phenylephrine, and then um, it is used for this uh, simple uh, like testing, which is usually done at the eye clinic, okay? All right, then is, uh, you see over here, if I have attached, pictures over here so you can see why the doctor does it you see here is the optic nerve here are the retinal blood vessels and here is the macula right however if you see if we look into a person who is having diabetes so you see the person won't be able to see properly because the retina photoreceptors are damaged okay they're damaged due to various reasons which i'm not going to discuss right now but I'm sure you have seen like over here, how exactly the doctor is looking into eye by uh, you know, uh, putting a light beam across it, <clears throat> across the people. So that retina is easily seen. This process is also called uh, uh, fun, uh, fundoscopy, okay? And it, uh, this is a test that allows a health professional to see inside the fundus of the eye and other structures. Okay, so this is, I'm sure you all can now uh, relate to the refractive measurements that uh, how exactly the doctor actually keeps on changing the lens and everything. So uh, they know that what eye power you have. And these are the few uh, Refractive errors, which are there, which is hyperopia and then myopia. And hyperopia is um, there when you, uh, and, and then you put a conca convex lens in front of the eye, okay? So it is corrected. And then when you put a concave lens in front of the eye, then myopia is corrected. All right, then is treatment. Okay, this is um, uh, this is a de like development, okay, which is um, which is called synechia. All right, synechia formation. Now, what is this? Synechia is an eye condition where the iris adheres either to the cornea or lens. You see, uh, wait, you see over here, lens is this. All right, it, it, you, this basically three things together make up the terminology uvia okay so what are these three things this is choroid then this is ciliary body and then this is iris I, i'm sure if you have watched my video which i made uh, for you all regarding eye you must have uh, uh, you must are aware of the entire thing that how exactly this iris ciliary body and choroid work and what are their functions um well so these three are collectively called uvia. Now what happens is this, if this lens, all right, you see the iris is attached more towards the lens. So over here, the back side is getting affected, all right? Choroid is actually the uh, covering on the retina so that uh, the reflection is not there within the eye, all right? Then this iris, if this is pulled towards the more towards the cornea, so this is like anterior uveitis. Okay, so in order to deal with the synechia formation, which is the attachment of the iris towards the um, uh, towards the cornea, okay, this is anterior uveitis, which I just told you right now. 
or um, simply we can call aritis. Aritis is actually inflammation of the um, iris muscle. All right, in order to treat it, in order to prevent it from uh, formation of Seneca, what we do is this: we administer homotropine, which is muscarinic antagonist, along with phenylephrine, and then in adjunct the, the treatment, this is being treated. Then, uh, when we talk about the therapeutic uses of the CVF, so you see, uh, myocardial infarction is there, right? So it treats the acute myocardial infarction. Acute myocardial infarction means that it just happened right now and all of a sudden it developed. So in order to prevent it from developing even more, so what is done is this, um, atropine is injected so that the heart rate in, is increased, positive chronotropic, bromotropic, and inotropic effects are there. <clears throat> then we have therapeutic uses, sym uh, symptomatic, urine urgency, inflammatory, bladder disorder. Okay, so this is one therapeutic uses of the anti muscarinic drugs, which is atropine and other muscarinic receptor antagonists, such as oxybutynin and trospium and other more selective M3 receptor antagonists. These drugs are additional agents in this class to treat certain urinary tract disorders. Then uh, this drug, this class of drug also helps to treat Parkinson's, Parkinson's disease. Not like completely treat, but um, as a supportive medicine we give that, okay? So anti, basically what is Parkinson's disease? Let's talk about it. You see, dopamine, uh, we have discussed the neurotransmitter dopamine, right? So in a normal healthy patient, okay, the dopamine, you see how much of the dopamine is secreted, right? It's in good amount. But in Parkinson's disease, the dopamine is like, it, get, it gets like really less in quantity. And that's why the entire person is affected by it, okay? So in order to treat the person with Parkinson's disease, along with dopamine, basically this levodopa is a, a kind of a medicine which enhances dopamine uh, quantity in the presynaptic cleft, right? In the synaptic cleft, uh, levodopa enhances the dopamine uh, quantity, right? So along with it, we do give anti muscarinic drug, which is benztropine by pheridine and then trihexyphenidyl. All right, so this is how the Parkinson's disease symptoms are like. Okay, the mnemonic is TRAP. And what is TRAP indicating? Tremor, all right? Tremor is more about shaking. Usually started on, starting on one side, rigidity, stiffness of the limbs, neck of the trunk, a kinesia. A means not kinesia means movement, right? So it means the voluntary movements are impaired or they're completely lost. And then posture is in balance, right? They're affected. So you, I tell you what, when I, I, I think I discussed in my previous videos with you all that I basically uh, did my research on dopamine, right? So literally I do have um, seed rats where the rats suffer from Parkinson's disease, we actually induce them Parkinson's disease. And uh, the rats cannot move uh, like for one minute, sometimes two minutes. And I've even seen a rat standing on one position for like three to four minutes. So that's how it can happen. Like the person would, you know, they would clench everything and then they would stand for a good amount of time, okay? You see the rats, they don't stand in one place, but when the rats were induced Parkinson's disease, so they stood for a while. Not for a while, a lot of time they stood. Okay, so then is scopolamine, which I also discussed a bit earlier. So it is used in motion sickness, all right? And then it causes amnesia and sedation. And I tell you what, this is the drug 
which is used as a day trip drug because it causes delirium delirium uh, means forgetfulness all of a sudden you develop forgetfulness and then you develop has a hallucination and sedative effects are there so this sedative effects and hallucinations actually make the person uh, like first of all they don't remember like amnesia is there and along with that uh, sedation is there and along with that they would you know keep on thinking that uh, what do we have to do if, like what was that even all about uh, secondly if you see over here scopolamine is actually given to the people as a patch okay uh, we discussed at the start of our classes which we took at university when covid was not there so uh, we do have this transdermal patches all right which they attach at the back of the ear and then everything is controlled secondly we have atropine and scopolamine so it can suppress bronchiolar secretion during surgical and spinal anesthesia and to prevent the muscarinic effects of ACHE inhibitors used to reverse muscle paralysis at the end of the surgery then is ipratropium and teotropium they are used as an inhalant to treat reactive airway diseases such as asthma and chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases which is also abbreviated as copd then is atropine it blocks peripheral and uh, central nervous system effects due to cholinergic excess especially those caused by poisoning with um ache inhibitor containing insects insecticides and muscarinin containing mushroom so like i said this is natural right atropine is natural biotin is natural so they are actually present in mushrooms i'm sure in pharmacology you would talk more about it okay this is one side which actually um, like summarizes all of the effects of anti muscarinic drug okay so in i we do use them for uh, refractive measurement ophthalmological examination uveitis and eritis then hot we deal we uh, treat them uh, we treat acute myocardial infarction then um, in bladder we treat urinary urgency then when we talk about lungs uh, then the therapeutic use is surgical anesthesia to suppress secretion pnf deals with motion sickness scopolamine and parkinson disease and then cholinergic poisoning is there which is treated with anti muscarinic drug now treatment of uh, anti cholinergic poisoning okay so i just said in the beginning of my lesson that first of all we do symptomatic treatment all right like if the temperature is really high we deal with it if the blushing is there we deal with it like individually okay otherwise what do we do in this uh neo uh, uh, and then what do we do is neostigmine is used to treat poisoning with quaternary muscarinic receptor antagonist contradiction do not use these drugs when a person already has glaucoma especially anger pressure glaucoma do not use this drug if the person has git and urinary tract obstruction or if a person has gastric ulcer the drug interactions do not give anti muscarinic drug with antidepressant antipsychotic antihistamine you would talk about them in more detail in other classes okay what are they but as the name suggests that antidepressant is all about dealing with depression antipsychotic dealing with the uh, hallucination or you know the antipsychotic wale cases mein and then we have antihistamines antihistamines deal with the allergy and everything all right everybody thank you so much i hope you would study at home i know there is a lot of electricity problem these days everybody suffering but what to do life has to move on thank you a lot of